Welcome back to Luftwaffe at Sea. I hope you've all been good little boys and girls and watched the first one first. And I am very thankful for the positive reaction there too. So without further ado, let us move into Prelude to War. Now I want to first say that there is going to be some overlap between the last video, which was the opening uh, kind of years of the Luftwaffe and Spain, and some here. But this is going to be more an introduction to the aircraft that would have seen service in the first years of the war. So this is, of course, the second installment in the Pentology, and we're going to really look at the ones that entered service in the late 30s, uh, the craft that Germany would have phoned herself using had the Munich crisis been resolved on the battlefield, and the developmental steps and dead ends that illustrate Germany's military buildup. After all, it was in 1938-1939, with war on the horizon and the fates of the rump states left in the wake of Blessed Charles' empire that you know, collapse really hung in the balance when Austria, Bohemia, and Moravia fall under the shadow of the Reich, uh, ironically led by their own offspring, that Germany evolved from a recovering industrial nation into one that was really a true military power. It's also the last great big burst in terms of variety and development of maritime aviation. What you're going to see is that during the war, a lot of the aircraft that are here are really the beginnings of later developments. Uh, it also shows a lot of the civil designs that would become some of the preeminent maritime aircraft during the war. So it uh, kind of shows how the outdated designs of the 20s were going away and a truly modern Luftwaffe was coming. And, uh, you know, had this war even started a few months before it really did, the Germans were really not going to be considered as advanced as they appeared to be by 1940, say. And I think that's going to be shown here. So now let's start with the float planes. They are unique in German service that the Germans pursued both simple and advanced designs that covered both shipboard and coastal service and ranged from small two-seaters through to large bombers. You didn't really see large float planes uh, being part of the Commonwealth or United States inventories, but in Germany they played a tremendous role in the war. And here we get to cover them. So let's start with the Arado AR-95. Now, the Arado AR-95 should perhaps have been covered in the last video as she was designed in 1935, 1936 was her first flight, she did serve in Spain, but only in an evaluative capacity. So the Luftwaffe was not pleased. Uh, she was deemed better off as an export product. The, her German examples were originally meant for Turkey, but instead they ended up with the Luftwaffe. Her swept wings, high vertical stabilizer, and small stature concealed what was a surprisingly powerful aircraft. She had a Banvay 132 that gave her uh, 880 horsepower. She cruised at 158 miles an hour. She had a maximum speed of nearly 200 miles an hour. I had an operational range of 680 miles. Uh, she was pretty impressive. She had two 7.92 millimeter MG-17s. One was forward firing, the other was trainable in the rear cockpit. Uh, she could carry a 1,764 pound aerial torpedo or an 1,100 pound bomb load. So for a small aircraft, she could pose a serious threat to coastal shipping. However, she was lightly constructed. And while this definitely gave her more power, it did not really help her in the long run. She was you know, exactly about half of the 30 or so that in one Luftwaffe service ended up finding themselves patrolling the waters of the Baltic. Uh, the others were used as trainers. She was really too light to put up with a lot of the demands that you really have to put on a military aircraft in that role. Uh, but she was extraordinarily pilot friendly, both at sea and on land. So it's she's kind of an odd duck in that way. But she gave Arado a lot of experience, and we would see where that went with one of the most famous float planes of all time, and that's the AR-196. So like the 95, she did first fly in 1936 as a shipboard recon aircraft, meant for just scouting and spotting. And after testing her in both single and twin float designs, the twin float design was chosen. It prevented the wing floats from causing the light airframe to rip, because you can imagine the pressure of you know, the two on the side and the one in the middle. And if you have a rough sea or if you have even waves of any significant amount, the ones on the side could rip apart uh, the wing of a lighter aircraft. So they went with the double in the middle. And it also gave mechanics easy access to the electrical, hydraulic, and flight control systems. So the power plant could also be accessed by a single large removable panel that was underneath the cockpit. And her wings folded backward for compact storage. 
The first 10 entered service in 1938. Um, there was another five that were assigned to land-based coastal float plane operations. And another 20 were produced prior to the outbreak of war. This was able to equip the entire German surface fleet. So it shows you a matter of scale, say, compared to the Royal Navy or the United States Navy in terms of size. Now, the um, AR-196 had a high canopy that maximized pilot and observer gunner's view. She was incredibly pi uh, popular with pilots. The uh, flew at 190 miles an hour, and she had a very low stall speed, which meant she could loiter for hours or take advantage of a 650-mile operational range, which you're looking at a tiny aircraft that, you know, that's pretty incredible uh, in a time when 300, 400-mile ranges were considered typical. However, she was, like Arado designs in general, uh, lightly armed. She had two 7.92-millimeter MG-15s, again, one in the front, one aft. Uh, she had no bomb racks or hard points. She was really just a spotting aircraft. Her airframe was so lightly built that she was you know, really not the sturdiest, and in heavy seas that created problems. However, unlike the AR-95, Arado kind of adapted her design. So beginning in November of 1939, the A-2 entered production. With a stronger airframe for land-based coastal operations rather than shipboard service, she did not have any floating wings, uh, which allowed them to be strengthened. Uh, the accommodation was for 210-pound bombs. Her hardware was generally improved. She had an additional MG-17 mounted in the cowling. Uh, the MG-15 was mounted in the wing, just so you know. And she also had two 20-millimeter MGFF cannon, which really made her a threat to river and coastal shipping. And she was better protected in any fight with the air enemy aircraft. So not only that, but an additional radio for the pilot uh, to use, in addition to the one that was for the observer gunner. Uh, that was installed. She had an improved propeller. She had reinforced wing roots, uh, and the fuselage. Uh, these were all, um, I should have started off, I'm sorry, but these were all for the A4 model that began in 1940 with the radio, etc. And you know, she was considered so versatile and effective that uh, the AR-199, which was supposed to replace her, really only came to 31 aircraft because they saw that the AR-196 could re continue in her role without needing just a minor replacement. Uh, the AR-199 ended up serving in sea rescue, and uh, you know the advanced streamlined variants of her, which were you know considered to be the, the cutting edge, they never felt a need to leave the drawing board, which shows two things. One, it shows the German preference for using what they had and thinking that the war was going to be short. But it also kind of shows that the AR-196 was able to adapt, improvise, and overcome. So... Um, and she definitely could hold her own against aircraft, uh, enemy bombers and recon aircraft. She could even be used to intercept uh, other scouts and especially British uh, floating, uh, sorry, British flying boats, things like that. She was used for coin ops, anti-shipping, anti-submarine activity. Uh, she even captured the mine laying sub HMS SEAL. In Finland, she was used as an insertion extraction aircraft. Uh, she was... Yeah, you know, definitely helped uh, with making supply runs. She could patrol the frozen waters of the Gulf of Finland and the Sotmi coast. And she even flew out of really far Arctic ports like uh, Inariyarvi and uh, Frangivuono to spot the Allied convoys. And you know, she is kind of famous for being famous in a lot of ways just because she was so ubiquitous. But her history is much deeper and richer than the few score aircraft who served aboard the German fleet can represent. But very few recon float planes um, can boast a regular return of aerial victories, service in the tropics and Pacific as well as the Arctic and South Atlantic, uh, even an extended post-war service. Um, actually, it surprised me when I was doing research that I found that the AR-196 retired in 1955. Uh, the three dozen that were used by the Soviet border guards were retired then, and they were not all captured examples. Some of them were actually built from captured parts, and the Russians kind of made the best of what they were able to get a hold of, but it does really show the versatility, the ruggedness, and the longevity of what became, you know, the AR-186 as we know it, but began as a simple light aircraft for shipboard service with very minimal multi-role capacity. 
Now that brings us to the Blomenvoss HA140. Now the uh, Blomenvoss, or more properly, the Humbuga Flugzeugbau 140 was designed by the famous Richard Bolt and was designed to fill the Luftwaffe's need in 1936 for a long-range torpedo bomber reconnaissance aircraft uh, requirement. She had three prototypes that more than exceeded the Luftwaffe specifications, and she competed against the much more famous Heinkel 115. Uh, she just left the 115 in her wake in terms of both airborne and waterborne performance. Pilot and crew satisfaction was much greater with the HA-140. And yeah, it was just really, her usability trials showed that she was a superior aircraft. And uh, that was in October 1937. Now, her nose may not be the prettiest little button on the block, and you know, can kind of understand that one. But her seaworthiness and the combination of excellent balance and float design really, uh, float design is incredibly important with these aircraft. They made up for any sort of aesthetic quirks. Now, the real drawback was that in these trials, she had kind of won a Pyrrhic victory. The Luftwaffe needed the HA 140s and it needed them quickly and in quantity. But Bayonfell couldn't quite meet that requirement because of the small size of their operations. So, you know, the 20s and 30s had not been kind to them, and they survived by reducing and optimizing their physical plant. So although they were successful, Heinkel was awarded the contract by default as there was no way for Blomentfoss to increase their production capacity as quickly as the RLM would have needed them to. But we're going to stick with uh, the Hamburger Flugzeugbau, which was Blomentfoss's aircraft subsidiary, uh, with the 139. Now, this is an aircraft a number behind in order since we just did the 140, but she's really a step ahead in terms of development, and the uh, aircraft is notable for appearing in action reports in January 1940 regarding the possible use of her, or the DO-26, as a seaplane to operate from North Base in Norway. Or at least notable to me since I happen to own copies of the Kriegsmarine staff diaries, because reasons. Uh, otherwise, she's best known as a mail carrier. The obscure part of history in the 1930s is the role that these aircraft played in promoting German prowess at sea. Now, after Italo Balbo's uh, conquest of the Atlantic, as it were, the Americans, thanks to uh, Juan Tripp of uh, Pan Am, and Juan Tripp was the, basically the be-all and end-all of Pan Am, kind of invented the clipper service and everything that it was known for. Um, you know, basically the Americans and the Italians dominated the sea above uh, and the air above it. This forced Germany and France into an uneasy alliance in terms of mail delivery and passenger service. So after first taking on transatlantic mail delivery uh, duties in 1934, Lufthansa was joined in 1936 by Air France, with Lufthansa sharing the southern air route to maximize both individual and collective strength, rather than compete against each other and lose out to British, American, and Italian you know, interests. So the HA-139 was really a game changer. When she entered service in 1938, uh, she was catapulted off of the Schwabenland and was considered state-of-the-art. She was faster uh, faster than the Dornia Van, but she was limited in range and dependent on depot ships to refuel her and catapult her to fly on the next 3,000 miles or you know, much less if she carried 1,100 pounds of mail. Now, her slow rate of climb uh, meant that it took 20 minutes to get to the optimal altitude of 10,000 feet. And her average speed for a plane of her size made the four-engine wonder only half of the engine Germany needed. The four Jungers Jumo 205Cs were only six-cylinder engines and diesels at that. So they limited her acceleration rate in exchange for greater range, reliability, and miles per gallon. The inboard engines were mounted at the joint between the anhedral and dihedral wings, and it gave her the inverted gull wing shape that allowed her wide set floats to give a much better seaworthiness without sacrificing lift. Now, the RLM first caught the eye of the Luftwaffe when she was proposed as a recon bomber under the title of Projekt Zwanzig. Uh, this went nowhere, but with uh, war coming soon, plans for the converting of the three examples for martial purposes were made. Uh, kind of helps that Göring ran both the RLM and the Luftwaffe, but you know, we have to see that where these uh, intersections were in development and operations. Now, the Luftwaffe wanted to use her for cargo transport and recon duties, uh, later serving as a minesweeper, but her diesel engines were really her downfall. 
She was slow, almost too sturdy to function in a wartime fashion. She was too easy a target, and she would never see frontline service. One was made a minesweeper with the magnetic ring running uh, from the nose to the float tips to the wings back to the empennage rather than as a circular ring. Uh, the circular ring just wasn't going to work with her. Uh, there's another example had the glazed nose added and defensive machine guns. And the third served in general purpose with, uh, you know, kind of cargo and, and transport. She had defensive guns added, but not as much as the second. And all three would just see service in the Baltic, where opposition was really not a concern. As for her companions, the catapult ships like the Friesenland, they were used during the war. Um, but they were used very sparsely. And they were generally used with other aircraft, such as uh, here you can see it with a... Uh, Blomenfoss 138. In this regard, the 139 was a very useful aircraft in helping improve the state of maritime aviation. Uh, she was also the foundation for the later uh, Befal 142, which we'll save for later, but you know, in, in and of itself, she didn't really offer much, but she's a very useful stepping stone to cover. So now as we leave uh, Hamburg of Flugzeugbau, we turn to Heinkel, and Heinkel really would have the best luck at sea. Now, the Hunkel 114 was a planned successor of the HE-60, which was the recon and rescue biplane. And she competed against the Arado AR-196 for the job. She was much smaller than the HE-60. She was small twin float sesquiplane with a crew of three. And after upgrading her engines, um, five had been tested on as many prototypes. So they ended up having training variants and operational variant were built. They were only in small numbers. Even after the five different versions were tested, it didn't really add up to much. She was liable to tip on the water. She was unstable and sluggish in the air. And she ended up being mostly sent out for export with only a handful seeing service uh, with the Luftwaffe. Sweden got 14. Uh, Romania got a dozen, which they called uh, the 114B2. The uh, Swedish version was the 114B1. Uh, another 14 C1s with two guns in the cowl instead of one ended up in Romania. Uh, Spain got four unarmed training variants. And only four small Luftwaffe units would ever use any that the Germans kept for themselves. It was uh, Seaufklungs, uh, Seaufklungsgruppen uh, 125 and 126, uh, Borsegergruppe 196. And they would only use them until replaced by Arado 196s. And uh, the one, the only one that held on to them really was Kusentika Gruppe 406. So after the conquest of the continent, they basically saw service in the Eastern Med, uh, around the Black Sea. The only place that she really found uh, a good use, and it's kind of curious, was aboard the auxiliary cruiser Atlantis. And uh, one of them was stored in Cargo Hold 2, and another was kept on the lift in that same hold that led up to the hatch. And it just kept them disguised. Uh, you know, of course, she, the auxiliary cruisers wanted to appear to be regular merchant vessels. Uh, but it's kind of interesting that they found a use in, in there of all places. But Heinkel's most famous seaplane was also developed in these years, and that's the 115. She was a triumph, definitely, and she saw service in nearly every role there was to serve at sea. She was a mine layer, a mine sweeper, a reconnaissance aircraft. A patrol bomber, a torpedo bomber, a level bomber, it's, she did everything. Now, while only 138 were built, she was an invaluable resource after entering service in 1939, just over a year after her first flight, in uh, August 1937, when she competed against the HA-50. As I mentioned beforehand, uh, I just said 37, I want to say, uh, you know, she entered service a year after entering production. Anyway. She set records for speed over 620 miles and 1,200 mile routes. Uh, she was a reliable, spacious, versatile, uh, rugged aircraft that you know was definitely put through her paces both in action and in rough seas. She was faster than most float planes. Uh, she was able to exceed 200 miles an hour. Um, her operational and combat loaded range was an uh, incredible 1,300 miles. For her size, she had a crew of only three. And she was lightly defended, in, at least in her early variants. She held uh, over 2,700 pounds of ordnance, or she could carry an 1,800-pound torpedo. Uh, with the torpedo, she could even carry up to 1,100 pounds of bombs in addition. She could carry a single 2,050-pound mine, uh, but she could not 
mount two torpedoes except in dedicated variants, uh, which does separate her from other twin-engined aircraft of her size. Now, later variants included those with steel reinforced floats, which allowed them to operate from snow or ice. These could also carry multiple mines, they had improved defensive armament, and they could even load auxiliary fuel in the bomb bay without sacrificing the external weapons loads. So she really was a jack of all trades, and she really did all of them well. That was until she had to face Allied carrier aircraft and catapult fighters in the Atlantic, uh, long range heavy fighters in the Baltic and the Black Sea. Up until then, she was a serious threat to Allied military and merchant shipping. She operated from Arctic bases, the Frisian Islands, the Greek Isles, the French coast, anywhere she was needed. Uh, she could rescue men at sea, drop supplies to the stranded, strike shipping, uh, even land special ops uh, units, like such as weather units uh, even, and operate with near impunity thanks to excellent low altitude handling, plenty of lifting power she could scoop underneath Allied radar, her crew had plenty of access points for supplies. Uh, they were kept in these dedicated half-cylinder watertight containers. Uh, they provided access to repair for their own craft at sea via uh, tunnels in the wing route. Uh, crews were highly trained in flight and combat operations, as all personnel were. But they were also cross-trained as mechanics and in offering first aid to those being rescued at sea. So they could repair their aircraft at sea, they could take on uh, those they were rescuing and do more than just transport them. You know, really, the, her crews deserve a lot more credit than I think uh, anyone's really offered them. Now, interestingly enough, she was also one of the few aircraft to serve both the Allies and the Axis. The Norwegians had a half dozen on hand at the time of the German invasion, and they employed them against the Germans with uh, some success, both in uh, maritime uh, roles and in ground support. Another two were actually captured by the Norwegian infantry and added you know, to the inventory that uh, the Germans probably weren't expecting that to have happened. And as Norway fell, four of them flew to the UK where they were used by the Norwegians in exile. And they saw service mostly in the Eastern Med and the Black Sea. And as Norway fell, uh, four of them were flown to the UK, where they were used by the Norwegians in exile. And taking advantage of a range and durability, they were employed for covert operations uh, in Norway and in the Bay of Biscay, as well as the Med. And in the Med, they uh, flew a lot of clandestine missions out of Malta, which is kind of curious. So there's honestly too much to be said about the 115, and uh, I have a feeling another video might be necessary there. However, I recommend searching for German footage of her in action, as it's not difficult to procure. Even if you don't speak German, we all speak the common language of the aviation fanatic. So with that, we close out the float planes and move on to flying boats. And, you know, this is definitely a place where Germany had a good reason to boast of her assets. Now, part of the reason for this is that designers like Dornier and Blomenvoss were able to operate through the interwar period without interruption or restriction. You know, they designed civilian flying boats during the Weimar years. Other designers were keeping their hand in the trade through front companies in the Netherlands and elsewhere, so that's also a way that Germany did, but in terms of flying boats, the Germans really were on par with, uh, you know, some of the best in the world. So let's go back to uh, Blomme de Foss, and we're going to look at the uh, Beifel 138 trimotor floating uh, flying boat. She was beyond sturdy, and it kind of shows that a shipbuilding company, you know, made her. Uh, the 138 was an excellent aircraft, her crew loved her, um, both at sea and in the air. She first flew in 1937, but didn't really enter production uh, until after a redesigned hull and more powerful options were adopted. The uh, first 25 examples were produced beginning in late 1939. Uh, during the early months of the war, they saw transport uh, saw services transports in the Norwegian campaign, but they weren't really assigned to units until July 1940. So upgraded models like the 138B1 had 20 millimeter cannon in the nose, uh, Junkers Yumo 205D engines. The B1 stroke U1 carried three small bombs. Uh, they added a 13 millimeter machine gun too, which was in a position above the central engine nacelle, another in the rear of the hull, and yet another one in the starboard hatch, um, which I can't imagine being in the <laughs> above the uh, central engine nacelle trying to do anything, but there she was. Uh, the most produced version, though, was the C-1. 
She was much more agile uh, than some of the others. She was just as rugged as her predecessors. And she was able to take part in strikes against Allied shipping. Uh, she could even carry extra fuel to refill herself at sea. Uh, because, you know, you're flying long trips from Norwegian fjords to go uh, reach out and touch somebody in the Allied convoys. So she really does serve a really important role in the North Atlantic. She's also one of the rare examples of inter-service cooperation, which is not Germany's strong point during the war. One of her first roles was uh, spotting shipping and passing that information on to U-boats. So she brought U-boats their mail at sea as well, and the you know, emergency supplies. She was able to provide the submariners with medical transport uh, if anybody should be injured on board. Uh, it was really just one of those interesting, uh, rare examples, like I said, where the Kriegsmarine and the Luftwaffe were actually cooperating at that stage in the, the Battle of the Atlantic. Unfortunately, she was slow. Uh, she had a top speed of only 177 miles per hour. She cruised at 146 miles per hour. It took her almost half an hour to climb to 10,000 feet. Her op operational range was, you know, 758 miles, so it wasn't good, wasn't bad. Uh, I mean, it was better than most flying boats, but not as great as some of your allied long-range flying boats. And none of that really kept her from being a workhorse of the Luftwaffe and an excellent fleet support aircraft. And uh, with small numbers outfitted for minesweeping, the 227C1s were a major component of the Luftwaffe's spine in many different roles. So now another famous flying boat was the unique uh, Dornier DO-24. She also serves as another example of an aircraft that was both an Allied and Axis service. In fact, she was not even originally designed uh, to be in German colors. She was originally designed for service in the Dutch East Indies. And she had been evaluated almost as a side thought by the Luftwaffe, uh, and they compared her to the uh, Befel 138. So of the 294 total examples from prototypes of the last one off the line, 37 saw service in the Dutch East Indies with the Marine Luftfahrtdienst. Uh, while this series is about the Luftwaffe and, you know, really about the Luftwaffe's inventory, um, I don't feel that this aside is really inappropriate. And in fact, it's, it's quite interesting. So, so she was part of a Dutch order uh, that the MLD placed for 78 large seaplanes and 22 general seaplanes that were to be capable of torpedo strikes. And at the center of this was the DO-24, uh, together with their own Fokker uh, T-8 torpedo bomber. Now, the war put a stop to the 1937 planned buildup, and the United States became the new shopping mall for the Netherlands Purchasing Commission. But in the East Indies, she served alongside the 41 examples of the DO-15 VAL that she was meant to replace. And while only six VAL remained operational, while 37 of examples of the DO-24K were there, um, it, she still made her mark. So only 12 of uh, which were not built in the Netherlands, by the way. So the uh, Dornier had established facilities there in the interwar years. Now the K-1 and the K-2 subtypes were those in Dutch service. And the only difference there was that one had the right R-1820 F-52 engine, the other had the G-102 engine. And this matched the Dutch Martin B-10 bombers. It may have taken almost a half hour to climb to 16,000 feet. Um, so she's only marginally better than some of the other flo uh, flying boats. But one of her great advantages, especially you, know, you can imagine in a, uh, in a heated environment, was that you could take off from a calm sea in as little as 17 seconds. You know, she didn't require a lot of space. She was quick to accelerate. Uh, she was a little bit cumbersome in climbing, but otherwise she was a great aircraft. She had a dorsal 20mm cannon, uh, which replaced the Colt Browning 7.7mm guns in uh, the other two Alcon dorsal turrets. And uh, they played a crucial role in the fight against the Japanese in the opening moves of the Pacific War. Uh, if that interests you, the battle for the NEI, um, definitely check out my series Walk Through the War uh, for the episodes covering that period. If you are watching Walk Through the War, don't worry, I am going to catch up uh, pretty soon. I just uh, figure out a way to skip a couple of weeks ahead. So, anyway, back to her Luftwaffe service. Uh, the major variant that was used by the Germans was the T-1. Uh, this was a development of the K-1 and K-2. There were also three examples that were uh, DO-24 N-1s. 
These were made from incomplete K2s captured uh, in the invasion of the Netherlands. But the 180 of the main T1 model built included 70 built by France, by uh, SNCAN, and 110 in the Netherlands. Now another 49 T2s with some minor differences were built at the Dutch yards and a dozen T3s uh, were destined for Spain. Now the French built examples, however, did not all see service with the Luftwaffe. Uh, 32 of them were uh, liberated by the uh, French Evo Naval as part of the uh, Flotte uh, Neuf F transport. And in German service, she was active as a transport search platform, U-boat support, reconnaissance cooperation, and especially in the all-important role of air-sea rescue, where many serve with distinction in every theater. There's also the interesting case of CMRY. Now, this was one of two which ended up in neutral Sweden. First, they were interned, then they were impressed into service. Now, the pilot of CMRY not only absconded with the aircraft, but with a very specific cargo that was his motivation. <laughs> his Estonian girlfriend. The second example, uh, which was one thought... Uh, for years to have been later appropriated by the Swedes uh, by a Soviet crew was more likely uh, scrapped by the uh, Schleifapnet. She was flown to Sweden on 9th of May 1945 with a uh, slightly larger passenger load from what was left of the German coast. She carried at least 37 refugees uh, fleeing the communist onslaught plus her crew. So that's uh, yeah, you know, CMRY may have come over with uh, an Estonian girlfriend, but the second one was definitely, you know, one of those uh, little keys and uh, one of those tiny moments in history where, you know, the the end of the war sees just extraordinary feats to get out of the way of uh, the Red Army, and to fit thirty seven refugees. Just the weight alone shows how rugged the aircraft was. Now, in technical details, the DO-24 T1s had a maximum speed of 215 miles an hour at, at uh, 8,500 feet. She cruised very efficiently at 183 miles an hour, uh, nearly 10 miles an hour faster than the DO-18, but she used much less oil, uh, fuel to do so. Uh, her normal operating range was over 1,800 miles, so that's a great asset. She was able to carry several litters for wounded, supplies, flotation aids, and airdropped canisters. Uh, or she can carry them internally with her crew of six. She had an armament of a 20mm cannon in the dorsal position and single 7.92mm guns in nose and tail positions. She could carry uh, 2,650 pounds of ordnance in her underwing hardpoints. Uh, she had a streamlined hydrodynamic and aerodynamic hull with excellent handling and performance characteristics. And it guaranteed her a place in service well into the late 1960s. Uh, the last examples were those built for Spain, and the French sold off uh, examples to the Spanish Air Force to put to use. The last one was returned to the Dornier plant at Lindau on the Bodensee as a display model, and that was in 1971. So the DO-24 is definitely a plane to be remembered. One that is less remembered and you know, barely uh, documented even is the uh, Vesoflug uh, VE-271. Now, Weserflug, uh, founded in 1934, is a subsidiary of the shipping conglomerate uh, Deutsche Schiff und Maschinenbau, uh, named, of course, for the Weser, the river that runs through Bremen. The 271 was designed as an amphibious flying boat, similar in style to some of the Grumman models in the States. It was definitely a departure for German designers. She had a modest top speed of 140 miles an hour, a slow rate of climb of 4 minutes to 3,500 um, feet, which is for her size, a bit slow. She had somewhat long takeoff distance on water. It took over a half a mile for her to take off in calm seas. Uh, her poor seaworthiness really meant that she could only operate in harbors, coastal waters, and the long takeoff uh, kind of kept her out of rivers. The only real benefit that she had was a short water landing clearance. Uh, she also was very sturdily built um, for good or bad. And like I said, it was a unique style that really stood out in, in Axis service. Now, the single example, D-O-R-B-E, flew on 26 June 1939. Uh, test pilot Gerhard Huber found her to be acceptable. But after 19 flights, she already needed fixing. Um, she needed deflectors fitted to the floats and fuselage. There was a problem of water entering the power plants and fouling the propellers, so those were definitely needed. 
but she was underpowered and slow. Her, her power plants were twin Argus AS-10E, uh, which were inverted V8s that had very low power. But they were reliable. I mean, they were plentiful. They were easy to maintain. They were affordable. But they were used by aircraft like the Arado 66, the uh, Fokovov uh, 44, the uh, Fieseler 156, the Storch. They were never really made to power a flying boat of any size. But, you know, even though the 271 never experienced any flight problems in what limited use she found, there was really, the engine itself probably could have been a better choice. Uh, only the one was ever made. And in 1942, uh, by then she'd flown about 60 to 80 flights. She was turned over and used as a hack at uh, Trevemunde by the uh, Erpobungstelese. There was really no place for her in the Luftwaffe, especially after a small craft like her in the you know, Bay of Biscay, the Channel of the Norwegian Fjords. The demand just disappeared. Uh, where she fits in here is, is an interesting side trip into small flying boats, uh, really after an American fashion. That would have been useful in amphibious operations in 1940. Uh, certainly more efficient than some of the large, large flying boats, but she found no, no real role in a war where the Allies had unquestioned control of the air over the water, and the Mediterranean was just, it was too hot a combat zone for such a craft. Still, it's a curious one-off, and I think it deserved a mention. Now on to much more well-known examples, we have the first use of land-based aircraft in maritime roles in the late 1930s. Like float blade and design and the employment of military roles, this was another field where the Luftwaffe could really call an experience and uninterrupted design evolution, thanks to land-based transoceanic and maritime commercial endeavors. For example, uh, Dornier went from flying boats to bombers quite readily, even as far back as their earliest land-based aircraft. Uh, these were bombers designed for Germany, uh, the German Army's endeavors in Soviet Russia years before Hitler came to power, and other companies focused on purely civil affairs. And yet these would serve in military colors exceedingly well, uh, including Falko Wolf's very successful airliner, the Condor. But uh, let's start with you know the Dornier DO-17. And I don't want to spend too much time on such a well-known medium bomber, but it's worth mentioning since a maritime role was an active part of her operations early in her service. Uh, beginning in 1937, Elfklärungsgruppe Fern uh, 122 took on the DO-17 F-1. Now, this was a general reconnaissance group, um, but the unit's responsibility included the coasts, and the overlap would have been a part of the 17's you know, career at that point. Elements of the group were dispatched to Spain, where they earned the nickname the Bagalion, uh, or Bagaleo probably. Sorry, my Portuguese is better than my Spanish. And they replaced the Heinkel 70 as a photo recon aircraft, as well as a short and long range recon platform. They flew missions as far out as the uh, Balearic Islands, far into the Bay of Biscay as part of the Legion Condor's maritime screening activities. But as the Civil War pressed on, the DO 17 was found to be too vulnerable. A new aircraft could intercept her easily, such as the Polycarpov uh, I 15s and 16s. Dornier improved the engines, they added another machine gun to discourage head-on attacks, they increased the bomb load, but is that, it was that really thanks to this experience that the DO-17 entered the war as not the same aircraft that had first flown in the late 30s. She underwent a lot of development. And, you know, she made her mark both as a bomber and as the Luftwaffe's eyes on land and at sea for, you know, quite some time. Now, the 17th successor was the Dornier DO-215. And the difference in numbers is because this was intended as an export model. And once again, I don't want to get too far into it. You know, she's just a very well-known medium bomber. But she was held back as well by an operational range that wavered between 250 to 400 miles to over 700 miles when overloaded with fuel and, you know, only carrying um, RB-20-30 or RB-50-30 cameras. It would be the DO-217 that would excel as a maritime strike aircraft, a role that she was actually designed... Uh, with the intent to serve. But the 215 would instead be used as a strike aircraft over the channel, as a coastal reconnaissance aircraft, but only when forced into that role, and not as a dedicated maritime aircraft, or as a platform regarded as appropriate for maritime use. So very much unlike the DO-17, which she was intended to replace. Now, that doesn't mean that the 105 aircraft that saw service, um, you know, that they weren't needed. The uh, 
they saw service over the North Sea uh, when every available aircraft had to be on hand to counter Allied naval prowess. Uh, but we'll, we'll kind of save the 217 for later discussion to make the most out of the context of her anti-shipping prowess. So from now on, let's move into something towards which I'm positive you all have been looking. And that's the Falcon of Condor, the, uh, the F.A. Zweihundert. The name alone conjures up imagery of the Battle of the Atlantic and Arctic convoy raids. She was, she was famous before the war as one of the first civilian land planes designed for transoceanic passenger flights. You know, when uh, Pan Am, Lufthansa, KLM, and the predecessors to a, a, a BOAC, which were Imperial Airways and British Airways, you know, they focused on seaplanes and flying boats. And Kortank, there's a name to recognize, Kortank proposed that a land plane, which could fly economically at 10,000 feet, you know, just shy of necessitating uh, pressurization, could be uh, fitted with sufficient fuel to make long-distance trips within and beyond the continent. And she took her name from the particularly long wingspan that accommodated her four engines. And the uh, first prototype was fitted with auxiliary fuel tanks and made the first nonstop flight between Berlin and New York City. So a 25-hour flight, she landed, uh, I think it was from Stockton in uh, Berlin. She landed at Floyd Bennett Field, which if you've never been there, go visit, please. And the uh, the return trip, I think, was uh, just over 21 hours. Of course, the difference in the winds for you. So it was an incredible aircraft. Uh, the same one, which, you know, the, the FAL one, would later fly from uh, Berlin to Basra, then on to Karachi, Hanoi, and finally to Tokyo in another endurance flight. For those of you who enjoyed my video on the uh, Amio 143, you may recall a similar flight undertaken by that aircraft, uh, the one terminating in Hanoi, and it involved much more stops, uh, many more stops. The FW-200 show, you know, kind of shows that the FW-200 was a technological leap, and it was also an advancement in luxury. Not until the Boeing 307 and the Douglas DC-4 of the early 1940s did passenger flights of similar ranges and similar levels of comfort begin to be common. And of course, uh, you know, these aircraft also flew thousands of feet higher than the three or 4,000 feet that uh, was the normal cruising altitude at the time. And she began service with uh, not only Lufthansa, but also with her Brazilian subsidiary, uh, Sindicato Condor. She was also put to use by the uh, Danske Luftfahrtsalskap, which had two examples, uh, Dania and Jutlandia. The former was taken by the British after the invasion of Denmark, uh, while the latter served with DDL as a passenger aircraft throughout the war. She made flights to places like neutral Sweden, and she took advantage of Denmark's relative freedom, if you want to call it that. Um, she would end her career when damaged beyond repair in 1946 during a landing at Nordholt. Uh, it was probably one of the very few passenger flights between the continents and England in that year. Uh, meanwhile, in Brazilian service with uh, Sindicato Condor, that became uh, Servicios Aéreos Cruzeiro do Sul on the 16th of January 1943 when uh, Gadurio Vargas nationalized the airline. Uh, while the U-52s in service uh, began to be replaced by Douglas DC-3s, the Condor stayed on. Um, the last one left service in 1947. Uh, that was only due to a lack of parts. Um, and another one was lost also in 1947 at the Santos Dumont Airport when she struck a DC-3 also landing. But in the military role, the first one came from a retrofitting of an example which had been destined for Dainipon Goku. Now, these were the blueprints for the C-Series, really, and she had hard points and defensive machine guns installed, while other Condors remained in the passenger role. They made regular flights to Sweden, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and elsewhere, and they had a normal complement of 26 comfortable passengers. Uh, those in a military role could carry up to 2,200 pounds in bombs or mines, and although it had a very rudimentary bomb site, they were responsible for the loss of over 365,000 tons of Allied shipping. What they would do is fly low level and drop uh, bombs in rapid sequence so at least one would hit the ship and hopefully the others would bracket it. So the normal armament though was four 550 pound bombs, although any reasonable uh, combination could also be carried. However, if the hard points were loaded, then her payload increased to almost 12,000 pounds of ordnance. But then the internal bay had to be empty to save weight or to hold auxiliary fuel. 
Her other role at sea, and one at which she uniquely excelled, was maritime patrol and submarine cooperation. While on land, she was basically in a VIP transport role and in making supply runs, even into the besieged Stalingrad. Now, initially, unlike almost every other example of a German bomber, there was really no push to use her as a military aircraft. Um, you know, G Germany was very good at designing passenger aircraft that were really bombers or in pushing civil aircraft into military roles, but it just wasn't the case with the Condor. But only days after the war began, uh, Hauptmann Ega Peterson would kind of put an end to that. Now, Hauptmann Peterson uh, was the staff captain of the Erste Staffel der Kampfgeschwader uh, Fünfzig. He was then assigned as an aid and advisor with uh, the Gerhard zur besonderen Verwendung der Luftwaffe 2, also Luftflotte 2. Uh, he was uh, notably experienced for just being a Hauptmann, as he had actually served in the Reichswehr's secret air warfare endeavors in Russia in 1929. In fact, that might have been what kind of kept his rank back uh, had he not served in uh, in Soviet Russia with the German-Russian cooperation. He might have advanced further. But his initial consideration was actually a study of using the U-90 as a long-range maritime aircraft. Now, only two were available, and Junkers had really no production facilities equipped to produce it. So he looked at uh, four of the FW-200s. These four were uh, being completed to be uh, sent to Japan. And instead, he took them and formed the Fernaufklärungsstaffel with uh, these four as well as six standard production examples. And that was on the 1st of October 1939 in Bremen. So the unit also had several, uh, albeit only temporarily so, um, you know, other kind of attachments, you could say. The uh, Berlin-based high-altitude research flight of the Abklärungsgruppe Oberfelshaber der Luftwaffe uh, was another one. So... Yeah, the uh, it wasn't really an offspring. It was more that, you know, as long as these condors were around, they, they went there. But they were more concerned with research than active service. The uh, Even though it was, you know, called an Aufklärungsgruppe, it was definitely more of an Apolbungsgruppe in that sense. And uh, But once Peterson's unit had expanded and his, you know, he had hand-selected, personally trained crews, uh, it was redesignated of the Erste Staffel Kampfgeschwader uh, 40, entered combat in the invasion of Norway with a strength wavering between two and six aircraft, hardly a Staffel, uh, experienced his first combat loss on 25th of May 1940, when uh, one was downed by flying officer at Grant Edie in his Gloucester Gladiator of number 263 squadron over Druya Island, which is in the far northern county of Troms. Uh, so, yeah, definitely she was vulnerable, to say the least. After the fall of France, uh, a much larger Erste Staffel Kampfgeschwader uh, 40 would operate in close quarters around the British Isles on mine laying missions and recon flights and really a bad place to put what is essentially a civil aircraft. It showed her vulnerability to flak, uh, forced the Condor's activities to back off and focus on their more usual routine of armed coastal recon after a loss off the Firth of Forth and another one over Belfast. And with the addition of a second Staffel, uh, you know, Kampfgeschwader 40 definitely grew, and they commenced with convoy activities. And this is where the Condor really shone. So after the uh, Beifel 138 made her debut in the spring of 1941, the Condor was ordered to serve only in a reconnaissance and patrol role. She was not to be a patrol bomber or scout. And ironically, her main enemies would appear only after this change in role. Uh, this was the first cam-launched Hurricanes, or the Hurricat if you prefer. Uh, they didn't down a Condor until August 1941. Uh, the Grumman Martlet, the British designation for the F4 of Wildcat, they didn't become a threat until the first escort carriers put to sea soon thereafter. Uh, but notably, she was the first German aircraft shot down by the U.S. Army Air Force when an example was shot down over Iceland in August 1942. It, just, it goes to show that the Luftwaffe was able to launch patrols from primary bases in Jutland as late as 1942 that were ranging all the way out to Iceland. Even into taking into account the great arc routes that were used to maximize efficiency, it's a testament to the Condor's capabilities and just sheer ruggedness. By then, her role had also expanded. Uh, the C-4 had Rostock search radar added, later upgraded to the Ho uh, Hohentfeier radar sets, which were much better suited for vessels at sea. Some of them later became anti-shipping missile platforms as the C-6 and C-8 models. Uh, they, could, they were made to carry the Henschel uh, HS-293 radar-guided sorry, radio-guided 
rocket power missiles. Uh, they also were outfitted with Holland file radar in the case of the C-8. And again, we'll cover more of this much later, but it wasn't really until 1944 that uh, production ceased and her replacement began in earnest, which were uh, Junkers 290s and Heinkel 177s. But the, not this wasn't before the 276 Condors, both civil and military, were produced. They were made with a mix of uh, dorsal turrets, which had 20mm cannon from the C-3 model onward, a mix of machine guns and twin lateral, as well as forward gondola, ventral gondola, uh, forward dorsal and aft dorsal locations. These were mostly of rifle caliber, except a single 13mm aft dorsal fitting in many models. And while lauded by many, she had a lot of faults. Uh, not only was she vulnerable, but in just some of her equipment. For example, the dinghies. They had a very finicky self-inflating apparatus that needed to be checked before every flight, lest one you know end up uh, depending on manual inflation, which could take almost an hour. If you had the patience to spare you know, 45 minutes before being faced with hypothermia, drowning, or some other nasty distraction, then have at it. But that's not something you want in a military aircraft operating at sea. I mean, not that it would really matter to crews regularly flying hundreds of miles from home in the North Atlantic. I'm sure the last thing that they worried about was cold water, right? But, I mean, seriously, it, it was definitely something that needed to be addressed and wasn't. The shift in missions to mine laying meant that the Condors were being lost to land-based fighters and flak. But with Peterson's connections to uh, Luftwaffe uh, chef de Generalstab General Mayor hans Jonik, the uh, Kampfgeschwader Fjertzig was able to move to first Belgian and later French bases. They operated with near impunity far out into the Atlantic as long as the Condors stayed far from catapult fighters, escort fighters, heavy flak, or land-based aircraft. So beginning with anti-convoy operations in the summer of 1940 out of Bordeaux and Brest, uh, with fewer than a dozen available at any given time in 1940, the Condor was earning a reputation you know, in the Luftwaffe that far outweighed her small numbers. And Kriegsmarine crews were you know, more than appreciative as they now had the benefit of airborne recon as far out as 24 degrees west. So to give you an idea, that meant that a Condor could operate right off the coast of Greenland, or in, if you're going to look uh, south instead of north, past the uh, Ilha de Zona Galon in, uh, in Portuguese West Africa. So there's so much more to discuss, but we're, uh, we're going to cover that in later videos and where operational activity rather than inventory is the focus. So now we've discussed capital ships, uh, catapult ships that were really repurposed civilian vessels, float planes or clearly shipboard aircraft. And as we go now to um, you know, carrier-based aircraft and rotary wing craft, that means I'm talking about the, well, the Graf Zeppelin. And yeah, that's a, there's a video or two for that already. But may as well cover it uh, very briefly. Of course, you can check out my videos there for the full story. But uh, just to mention, the U-87C uh, was supposed to be the dive and torpedo bomber for the uh, carrier at first. Uh, only prototypes were ever really made. Now, I covered the Germans one half-hearted attempt uh, in that video, like I said. But it doesn't mean that the U-87C was the only model for maritime aviation duties. There was the uh, BF-109T, which was designed to be the carrier-based variant. She ended up serving in Scandinavia with uh, Jagdschwader Zibonzipsis. Uh, but she never really flew in a maritime role. While the Stuka would fly in a maritime role in the Mediterranean, but later on. So right now, I mean, we should know that they're looking at that role, but... It won't really manifest until later. Uh, the U-87 uh, really generally deserves to be noted for its generous contributions to anti-shipping activities as a land-based bomber. And I think that it's important to note that the variants that were planned specifically to mount torpedoes, uh, whether based at land and sea, be discussed when they came about. So we'll get back to that later. But in the final category, if uh, you'd like to send a letter to the Prussian consulate in Siam by Aeromail on the 430 Autogyro, this might be what you want. The, uh, and here I'm talking about the Falkovov 186. Now, only a single example was built in 1937, and she was designed for use as a reconnaissance, liaison, and spotting aircraft to be used at sea as a shipborne aircraft. Uh, the Reichsfahrtluftministerium preferred the Fieseler Stoch. Uh, it was a more traditional design. Excellent short takeoff and landing capability, but what's important to note here is the ingenuity and the willingness to experiment with the rotary wing craft as an option at sea when 
Most of the world was happy with biplane float planes launched by catapult or the expensive investments of an aircraft carrier. Now, the American Kalet KD-1 was an American auto driver that was much earlier in development and had two examples and seven production examples purchased by the American Army in 1934-1935. Uh, she was used as a short hop airmail service from Camden across to Philadelphia. But it was initially a commercial undertaking. Uh, Eastern Airlines was the uh, original interest. Now, the Japanese Kayaba K-1 was built from a repaired uh, KD-1 airframe. She was not an original design. So one might say the 98 in Japanese service were really the full growth of an autogyro in combat role. But the Germans, despite all stereotypes, were actually a little bit behind where the autogyro was concerned. The Luftwaffe was, after all, very conservative in many ways where new technology was concerned especially for jets, rotor-winged aircraft, anything that would have meant that the war was expected to last longer than you know, the uh, propaganda told it wouldn't. That's really a, the problem when you buy into your own game. So while it's nice to look at the uh, Falkov 186, it's unfortunate that she really didn't see much of a... You know, and she wasn't really even the stepping stone that many people might point out that she was. But with her, we come to our conclusion. So, in 1939 and 1940, the Luftwaffe's maritime organization is going to grow in earnest. Uh, she was constricted to a few meager Kluppen and Staffeln, and the Luftwaffe felt it was really the best way to prevent the possibility of a true Marina Fliege, uh, a naval air service, from ever coming into existence. So if you want to check out the uh, battle between the services, check out Luftwaffe versus Kriegsmarine video, and also stay tuned for the next episode of Luftwaffe at Sea opening moves. Hope you stick with me for the full five-part series. And if you missed the first episode, check out the playlist. Once again, I'm sorry if my voice is a little hoarse, but yeah, I'm sure you'll forgive me. And the uh, we're going to move forward and glad to see everybody here again. I also definitely want to give a special shout out to my Patreon patrons and my YouTube channel members. Remember, you can help support uh, the Warbird Mistress for $3 a month on Patreon or even just a dollar a month on YouTube. And of course, share the video, spread the word, keep up discussion. You know, the, every like, subscription, and view is worth it. And I definitely appreciate your patronage and your time. So until next time, this is Claire, and I am the Warbird Mistress. Cheers.